Well, what a pleasure it is to be here among many friends and new faces that I look forward to getting to know. And what a wonderful opportunity to share my work. I've been thinking about this project for over a decade, writing on it for four plus years. And my hope and prayer is that it is of benefit to the church. So glad to explore it with you today. There we go. Well, our God has called us to a life of holiness, and with that call has certainly not left us alone. Chiefly, we have the power of God's own spirit to empower us for sanctification. And as an incarnational faith, vitally, we have fellow members of the body of Christ around us and before us. And of course, we have the word of God, living and active. And within that, we can read about examples of the faith we can imitate them as they imitate Christ. Today, I'd like to call our attention to a particular example, Mary, the mother of Jesus. Having grown up in a faithful and positively formative Southern Baptist church, maybe it was simply that I missed what was offered to me, but she was not a figure upon whom I spent much time in reflection. But as a New Testament scholar, I've found the few things said about her in our sacred text, I've found them inexhaustibly rich. I'm glad to present for you today Mary as a model of discipleship. I'll focus on a few scriptural vignettes which display the multifaceted and replicable nature of her faith. Then I will invite us to reflect upon the fact that Mary's story reminds us, as so many scriptural narratives do, that we are embodied beings. For though we can read about the various expressions of her faith and follow her in discipleship, we read about her at all because she is a mother. She allowed her body, a female body, to be a part of God's plan. There is a particular affirmation of God's ways with women in her account. This affirmation does not, however, lead to the detriment of men. Any good reflection on Mary will press us more deeply into a reflection on Christ. And there, the tables are turned. He was male, and so offers to our brothers an exemplar, nay, I should say the exemplar of discipleship, more closely aligned with their experience of the world than mine. Can a male savior save women Rosemary Radford Ruther queried famously. Certainly, we would all say. But in order to support that answer, in the final section, I transition from the particularity of Mary to consider the particularity of her son. As we follow the examples of the many faithful, Mary included, we must wrestle with how we are all, as Paul says in Galatians 3, ultimately following after and because we are baptized into the one male Messiah, Jesus. My hope is that we all may discover afresh both encouragement and challenge for the particularities of our embodied discipleship. So to Mary as exemplar, Christian tradition across all divisions widely agrees that Mary serves as an excellent example for discipleship. Protestants are included in this group. I will consider examples of her faith through her life with Jesus, seeking not to flatten the various distinct testimonies of the evangelists, but to hear them on all their power as we proceed through the chronology of her life with him. Canonically, readers of scripture meet Mary in Matthew 1.16. Although many interpreters, and our Catholic and Orthodox siblings are particularly insightful about this, would say that readers have been prepared by allusions going back all the way to Genesis 3.15. Chronologically, since Paul, of course, writes before the Gospels, the earliest mention of her comes in Galatians 4.4, when Paul says that God the Father sent the Son, born of a woman. I will begin, however, with the first event in her life that is recorded, the Annunciation in the Gospel of Luke. Luke has prepared the way for this universe-altering conversation by first telling the birth account of John the Baptist. Zachariah, who has longed for a child for years, 
encounters an angelic being when he is serving in the temple as a priest. Upon hearing the good news of a miraculous birth, his doubt results in the consequence of silence. The same thing then happens to Mary. An angel comes to tell her of a miraculous birth, which in the way that Luke has put the story together allows the contrasts between them to shine out in sharp relief. We can do the, the tables next to each other. She is young, female, in her space, not the temple. She responds with trust and then breaks forth in song. When the angel comes to her with a greeting that proclaims God's favor and presence, she is disturbed, not only by the angelic presence, but specifically at the angelic words. She does not accept this good news without considering it first. It seems that she's already counting the cost, as Jesus will recommend in Luke 14. Reading her hesitancy, the angel provides more information. The particular favor that God will grant her is that she will bear a child. It will be her lot to escape the anxieties associated with barrenness, the ones that plagued Elizabeth. Moreover, this son will be the one for whom many Jews had been waiting, an heir to the throne of David. If she were, in fact, among those populations of Jews who are anticipating the Davidic king, she would recognize immediately that this would be an incredible honor for her. But yet again, she resists. This is no plucky teenage girl who thoughtlessly agrees to a weighty task. She has a question. And I'm sure many of you have considered what an odd question it is. As a betrothed young woman, wouldn't it be natural for her to assume that she would bear this promised Messiah when her marriage with Joseph was consummated, who was also from the tribe of David? But an angel has been sent to her to say that her son will reign over the house of Israel forever, that his kingdom will not come to an end. The language of Gabriel's pronouncement draws from numerous occasions in Israel's scriptures where the heir of David is said to possess an eternal throne. These statements are often made in reference to David's seed. Now, this first applies to Solomon. But the text does not indicate that the audience at his coronation, nor the readers of Samuel and Chronicles, imagined that Solomon had been given the miraculous gift of eternal life. This seed would reign over the house of Israel forever. And although the seed would have initially referred to Solomon, at his natural and expected death, the seed would be embodied by his son, and then his grandson, and so on. The singular seed indicates a succession of many people. It is the seed, the throne, or the reign that is forever. Gabriel's words surely echo these royal promises, but they are also slightly different. And the difference centers on the singularity of the one who will sit on David's throne. He and he alone will reign over the house of Israel forever. He will not reign as one among many in a continuing line, but Gabriel says his kingdom, not his sons, nor his grandsons, but his will have no end. In this way, his reign sounds much more like the rulership of God, the only one in Israel's scriptures who is the subject of the act of eternal reigning. So Luke's Mary seems privy to these crucial details. The distinction of her son from previous sons of David and also his similarity to God. This could be why she asks about the nature of the pregnancy of this uniquely enduring son. Luke presents her as a quick study, a few steps ahead of the class. Her question, I argue, is not a non sequitur. She's not being obtuse. Instead, she's leading the angelic witness, questioning so that Gabriel can say explicitly what she might already have begun to guess. Her question indicates that she's already begun to perceive that her son will be called Son of the Most High in a way that was never true of any previous king. As far as Luke is concerned, 
Mary is the first human mind to begin to fathom the, nat the unexpected nature of God's long-anticipated reign. It is not that she and her husband will soon give birth to the Son of God, a political leader for the nation of Israel. Instead, she and she alone will conceive and give birth to the one who is truly God's son. Her question shows evidence of a certain kind of trust, an assumption that the proclamation Gabriel gives to her will happen, but one that the question moves to ask about mechanics. Hers is a faith that listens well and then clarifies the seemingly impossible. Luke has used her to underline a key point in the narrative. If her son was going to reign forever because he was truly the son of the Most High, not the son of any man, she wanted confirmation that her virginity played an important role in the fulfillment of that promise. Her question demands clarity, and Gabriel provides it. You do not know a man? Precisely. That does not disqualify you from bearing this child. It actually qualifies you. You will conceive this child as a virgin because this son will not be the son of Joseph nor any man, but truly the son of God. Her inviting question allows Gabriel to pro proclaim that her son will be son of God in a way that, has, that was, is true, that has not been true for any other. Because of her thoughtful reserve, she has now been given enough information to realize that the gracious infidation from God will afford her great honor. She will bear the Messiah, the Son of God. From henceforth, her story, her life, will be tethered and blessed by his. It will also be a cause of great shame for her. A claimant to David's throne will inevitably conflict with the ruling powers of the day. If he suffers, she too will suffer. And before the point when he ascends to his rightful rule, there will be explaining to do. Who would believe that the child in her room is holy, the son of the Most High? This could cost her betrothal, her place in her family, her life as she knows it. Counting the honor and weighing the shame, she accepts. The fiat that changed the fabric of our universe. Behold, the one you see here, messenger, I. I am the handmaiden, the slave of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. I accept your invitation. And although she does not know it yet, she has taken up her cross. She has demonstrated appropriate caution, thoughtfulness, trust, and acceptance, pledging her emotions, her spirit, and her body to God's use. She embraces holistically God's call to discipleship. With such grace-filled tenacity, Maybe it is no mistake that Christians throughout the ages have made her song, which appears just a few verses later in Luke, they've made her song their own. I have heard testimony, and maybe you have as well, from more than one person who have come to faith after attending an evensong service, where scripture is read and Mary and Simeon's words from Luke 1 are put to the most ethereal, beautiful music. After her initial acceptance, the Magnificat displays multiple features of maturing discipleship. Initially, it begins with joy. When one gives oneself to the God who is all goodness, this is cause for rejoicing, even and especially in the midst of the weight of discipleship. One can rejoice in the midst of trials because the follower of Jesus the Messiah knows clearly who they are. Notice here her dance between statements of humility. She needs a savior. She is lowly and is God's slave. And yet those statements are balanced with proclamations of her honor. God has saved her. All generations will call her blessed. God has magnified her. She displays neither false humility nor hubris, 
but is proclaiming truth in both respects. The truth of what it is to be redeemed by God, and in particular for her, the truth of what it means to bear God's son. She knows who she is because she knows who God is. The second half displays the strong God who scatters the proud, lifts up the humble and meek, fills the hungry with good things, and sends the rich empty away. This is the God of Israel. Who, and it is also a description of God, her son. She draws from the words of the prophets even as she foretells the ministry of her son Jesus and his church. The ministry of God, which begins to unfold in her lifetime, brings to life the ancient promises that God gave to Israel. She has hope for the future because she trusts in what God has said in the past. These are surely prophetic words, an artful evocation of God's nature, evidence of her own faithfulness in humility, gratitude, and hope. She is an example of what we all can sing of and follow. It is Matthew, that lengthy and loquacious gospel, that shows her steadfast commitment to her call, even in the midst of dangerous difficulty. Now, this might sound to you a surprising claim, given that Matthew says very little about Mary. It is Joseph who is the primary actor in chapter 1, and then Herod in chapter 2. But right after the opening genealogy, Joseph, Matthew tells us, somehow discovers that Mary is with child. Readers are not told how he made this discovery. The 2006 film, The Nativity Story, imagines that when Mary returns from her visit to Elizabeth, Joseph is thrill thrilled that she's come home. But when she steps off the carriage, her outer cloak becomes untied, and her protruding belly becomes noticeable. The way in which the actor portrays that dawning realization on his face is powerful. Matthew says in verse 18 that Mary was found to be pregnant from the Holy Spirit, but this is a statement of the knowledgeable narrator. Joseph does not know this when he first finds out about the pregnancy. The angel must tell him in a dream. It doesn't happen till verse 20. All that he knows is that this woman to whom he was betrothed is with child, and the child is not his. According to Deuteronomic law, if she has consented to this breach of her covenant with him, then she is liable to stoning. Now, evidence from the first century indicates that this was not a common choice in such a situation. More likely, Joseph could break the betrothal before the town council in a very public and shameful fashion for her. But Matthew tells us that he is righteous, and so he opts not to do that, but plans to put her away quietly. Consider, though, were he to leave, where this would leave her, Nazareth, Nazareth is a small village. If Joseph breaks the betrothal, that will become known. And as her womb continues to expand, everyone will know why he did. Her parents might too be likely to make assumptions of infidelity, as did Joseph. Even if he takes this most gracious option, Mary is left in a very precarious position. As a member of an oppressed people group, as one we know from Luke who is poor, young, female, effectively divorced, and pregnant, Courtney Hall Lee, in her amazing book, Black Madonna, describes Mary as the at-risk girl. I have often wondered if Matthew mentions women who had to turn to prostitution for survival in his genealogy emphasizing the horrific option that might have presented itself to Mary as well. It is Matthew, then, who provides the context for the decision Luke portrays her making. Being of age to be betrothed, she is old enough to know how the world works, the risk accepting this poses to her, and yet she accepts. And Joseph does as well. He trusts the divine messenger, consents to take Mary into his home, 
so that she avoids these dangers of exposure. But Matthew does not let the reader rest. Within just a few verses, another threat appears on the scene. Herod the Great. Given his track record of execution, readers would likely know his reaction to the news that another king was born in his territory. And the Divine Father intervenes again to protect the life of the Son, and the surrogate Father listens again to the angel, taking Mary and her child safely to Egypt. The verbal structure of Matthew's birth narrative overwhelmingly places Mary as the object of the action. She is most often carried along by Joseph, not unlike her infant child. But she is not a child. Six times over, Matthew names her as mother. And this, actually, the verb to bear, tiptoe, is the only verb of which she is the subject. The only thing Mary does in this gospel is bear a child. But that is no small thing indeed. While the action of this drama swirls with the gut-wrenching contemplation and then costly protectorate of Joseph, and then the maniacal violence of Herod, the steady in the center of this story is Mary, caring, bearing, nursing, and caring for her child in the midst of death's threats. Without her mothering, there's no need for any dramatic story at all. She is not passive, but present, embodying that unassuming virtue of endurance, remaining faithful to her call, no matter the danger. Luke includes this theme as well. When she and Joseph encounter Simeon in the temple, when they've come for the rites of purification after birth, and Simeon whisks away her weeks-old infant out of her arms, after proclaiming his enraptured praise for having been allowed to see the fulfillment of God's promises, he turns to Mary directly. A sword will pierce your soul. An ominous statement made even more so by its lack of detail. She does not leave her child who will be the cause of division with Simeon. She does not abdicate her part and her pain in his story, but takes him back takes him home to raise him, no matter how much pain that particular cross will cost her. And when her son takes up his own, she is willing to stand close enough to hear him bearing that excruciating pain. And she bears the experience of watching her own child suffer and die. Time fails me to recount her persistent yet respectful faith on display at the wedding of Cana, or her boldness in being one of the female slaves who proclaims the gospel to the crowds to whom Peter refers in his Pentecost sermon. Although we might read some of the statements in the synoptics to indicate that Jesus devalues her role as his mother, it becomes clear that this is actually a way of valuing her faith. She is not flattened to her biology, specifically to her maternity, or treasured only for her womb. She is a valuable member of this band of Messiah followers because of her faith, that she has heard the will of God and done it. Hence, to review all these ways she can be an example of discipleship for us all. In, in her concern, in her thoughtfulness, in her trust, acceptance, humility, gratitude, hope, and endurance, we can follow her example. Now, although she can be an example of faith and discipleship for each one of us, the chief particular expression of her faith is, of course, unrepeatable. The mode of her faithfulness in bearing the Messiah, bearing God, which leads to her conciliar name, Theotokos, the God-bearer, as decided and proclaimed in Ephesus in 431. This is why from henceforth all generations shall call her blessed. 
the way in which God chose to come into the world says something deeply profound about God's gracious holiness. The holy God not only chose to remain, not only chose not to remain distant from an unholy creation, not only chose to interact with that creation through revelation and the preparation of a space for the divine presence to dwell in the temple, but our God chose to enter into creation himself in the person of the Son. That holiness became embodied as a human through conception and birth, through and with the flesh of a woman. And therefore, it is unavoidable that this theological truth impacts women in a distinct way. Luke's penchant for historical detail allows that point to shine out with inestimable theological power. When Luke notes that she and Joseph and Jesus travel to Jerusalem for the rites of purification after a birth in Luke 2, he's calling forth the purity laws from Leviticus 12. Within the parturient law of Leviticus 12, it is clear that a woman is most impure after the first week of the birth of a child. And then she continues in that impurity for another 33 days. Note especially that Leviticus 12.4 states, she shall not touch any holy thing nor enter the sanctuary and until the days of her purification are completed. Menstruation, which is comparable to the bleeding a woman experiences after pregnancy, is viewed not as sinful, this is a vital point, but as impure as defiling of the holy tabernacle of God among the people. You can find this discussed in Leviticus 15. Now, the Christian story does not have its God disregard these purity laws. Mary is not allowed into the temple in the weeks after giving birth. To reiterate, Luke, without any defensiveness, shows that Mary follows the laws from refraining from the sacred space during her 40 days. It's during this time, though, that God works in some surprising ways. In the weeks after the birth, in the very time in which she was perceived to be in her greatest impurity, God is with her. The same God who set the laws for female purification and exclusion from the temple met this woman when she was existing faithfully within those laws. God does not abrogate the laws of purity and invite Mary to the temple before the time of her purification. Instead, God's divine action respects the laws that God, in fact, gave. But at the same time, God performs a radical act within these laws. The separation between impure humanity and a holy God has been breached. The law, with its pedagogy of human alienation, and it was David Louis who gave me that phrase, has prepared for a moment in which God has not asked Mary to transgress the boundary line, but God the Son has done so himself. God honors the realities of female embodiment, not by taking her out of her life to go to the temple and serve as a priest, but by keeping her in her life to remain at home as a mother and there, to handle the holiest of all things. Instead of bringing her into the holy space, God has made her the holy space. In the incarnation, God has deemed the female body, the impure, bleeding female body, worthy to handle the most holy thing of all, the very body of God. Societies throughout time and geographical space may have devalued the bodies of women, but our God did not. Women, the Christian God values your body, not only by calling it good as your creator, but by choosing to achieve the redemption of the world through it. When I presented an earlier form of this work in an academic setting, a preeminent and respected Catholic theologian exclaimed, I am experiencing holy envy of my sisters. Gentlemen, dear brothers, although you cannot share this particular encouragement that resides in the incarnation, you are not excluded from God's value. For, as I noted in the beginning, 
our savior is, of course, male. When we consider her son, her son, we are bold to ask, does Christ connect with men in a way that he does not with women? I was teaching a few weeks ago in a D-Men program, and one of the participants, a male one, voiced this question. Do I have more of Christ than you? Thankfully, he answered his very provocative question immediately. Of course not, he said, and I concur with him. The gospel message from the earliest moment includes all men and women. All are sinful. All are separated from God. And Christ came to defeat the power of sin and death for us all. All are called to take up their crosses in obedience. A clear place for scriptural support is, of course, the formula in Galatians 3.28. There's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor three. There's neither male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Christian texts are clear that God does not discriminate on any demographic axis, including sex, in our spiritual lives. This is true, and a point to be celebrated. But Christianity is not a only a spiritual faith. For if it were, we might call it by a different name, maybe Gnosticism. Instead, Christians, those who claim Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, as Lord, Son of the God of Israel, triune with the Father and the Spirit, we claim an embodied faith. That is precisely what is true of even this oft-cited passage in Galatians. For you know that this is a baptismal passage. I'll remind you of verse 27. Paul says, you are those who have been baptized into Christ, who have been clothed in Christ. What is being proclaimed here is a spiritual reality, but one that happens to one's body. No matter your particular denominational understanding of it, everyone does something with water to a body in Christian baptism. Moreover, Paul's correction of Peter that he recounts earlier in this same letter is that Peter was failing to do the embodied act of eating together with fellow Christians who were Gentile. Experiencing the non-discriminatory access to redemption in Christ is not a reality that's practiced only spiritually, privately, or only in the future kingdom, but that experience of redemption, if it is to be Christian, must be lived out now in communities of bodies. Hence, for robust Christian discipleship, I would invite us to consider not only Christ's spiritual life with the Father into which, by the power of the Spirit, he invites us all, but I would also invite us to consider his very body. New Testament authors all agree that Jesus was fully human, that he arose from a particular Jewish tribe, that he was, in Paul's words, born of a woman. Only Matthew and Luke give more details to the affirmation of his fully human beginning, and in so doing, they both assert in their own way that his conception was a virginal one. Mary was his mother, but Joseph was not his biological father. This is a truth that most of us would affirm, but let's think about its implications. Early in my own investigation of these accounts, and it is a set of musings that I've seen in my students as well, I wondered about Mary's degree of participation in this event. Might the conception of Jesus be like the creation of the first human, de novo, in which God creates the humanity of the Son, to which Mary then gives sustenance and birth, but maybe she served simply as an entry point for the Son, a blessed vessel through which he came into the world. As is so often the case, when we read our forebears of the past, we realize they've already entertained our questions and wrestled through to rich answers. Consistently and vehemently, the church rejected this vessel interpretation of the virginal conception. The overwhelmingly dominant position in the church has been that Jesus took his human flesh mysteriously, divinely, from the flesh of Mary alone. 
when Irenaeus argues for his real humanity, he states that the son would not have been human if he had taken nothing from the virgin. Tertullian gives evidence of this discussion when he pinpoints the difference between saying of her and in her. He concludes after extensive and adamant argument that Christ was born of the virgin's flesh. Origen affirms this as well in his assertion that Mary provided Jesus and David. At the Council of Ephesus, Cyril emphasized that the title Mother of God indicated that he united himself hypostatically to the human and underwent a birth according to the flesh from her womb. Bernard of Clairvaux hymns to Mary, he who comes from the bosom of the Father into your womb will not only overshadow you, he will even take to himself something of your substance. Modern theologians receive this point as the tradition in which they stand. Sojourner Truth exclaimed, where does your Christ come from? God and a woman. Man had nothing to do with him. T.F. Torrance asserts, we cannot say that his flesh was created out of nothing and absolutely de novo. It was created out of fallen humanity. And he states even more elegantly, the son is not a creation ex nihilo, but a creation ex virgine. The tradition has done, I think, the best coherent exegesis of the biblical texts. There is no other way that the son can enter and redeem the human condition and fulfill the promises made to Abraham and David unless he receives his flesh from a human. And for this task, God invited Mary of Nazareth. What we have in Christ then is a human male whose flesh miraculously by the power of God comes from a woman alone. Our Lord's very body includes both sexes a male embodied savior with female provided flesh. And given that our faith is an embodied one, it seems no mistake that the body of our savior includes all. As the body of Christ, the church embraces male and female, so too, by virtue of the virginal conception, does the incarnate body of Christ. This is massively important. But I think we can press further. It is wonderful that we are included in the divine life of the triune God. It is amazing that recapitulation happens in a body that exemplifies the Imago Dei. I think it is the template for the Imago Dei, male and female in the image of God. But Jesus lived as a man, experienced the world as a man. Hence, the question can remain, if he is our ultimate exemplar, exemplar for discipleship, does he connect with you men in a way that he does not connect with us women? I often speak with some women who wonder, can Jesus really get me and my experience of the world? Now we might have hit here upon what is commonly referred to as the scandal of particularity. God covenanted with and redeemed the Jews, not another people group. The fullness of time was in the first century and not another. The Son of God became incarnate as male, not as female. No one matches up with Jesus' human profile exactly. Uh, consider even his brothers. Same time, same family, same sex, but maybe they had a different Enneagram number. <laughs> no one is Jesus but Jesus. And yet his particularity does not inhibit his ability to save all. In fact, it guarantees it. As a particular person, he can fully save all of us humans who are particular people. Nevertheless, the scandals of the Christian faith, including that of particularity, should throw believers more fully toward the Savior instead of creating a distance away from him. It's my contention that Paul's reflections in Galatians 3 allow more to be said concerning Jesus' particular male experience of the world. Paul allows readers to begin to comprehend more fully the meaning of baptism, a spiritual and embodied act, with his next phrase, you have clothed yourselves with Christ. 
Now, clothes, as we all realize, have both an internal and external impact. Clothes make you feel a certain way and shape how people interact with you. Yes, they are on the outside, but they matter. They affect one's lived experience. It strikes me that Paul's word choice here is intentional. While there are several dozen occurrences of in duo to clothe throughout the New Testament, Paul is the only author to use this word metaphorically, to put on the armor of God, to put on the resurrected life, or as here, to put on Christ. This is for him a vital image that aids our comprehension of what is happening when faith in Christ is expressed in baptism. Because of baptism, we may say to Christians, you now wear Jesus. His life shapes how you feel about yourself and how you interact with the world and how your Christian siblings should interact with you. This gives new purchase, I think, on verse 28. There is not Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male and female. This might be faithfully translated as you no longer present in Jew or Greek, slave or free, male and female, but you present in Christ. In Galatians, Paul is telling all of them to receive one another. Now, in this life, practically in embodied ways, as they would receive Christ. If you have put on Christ in baptism, then you are all one, unified, and on that same level of honor and respect. I grant that clothing imagery is not perfect, because to be clothed in Christ is deeper and more long-lasting than any outer clothes. To present in Christ changes not only your feelings and experiences, but as Paul will affirm throughout Galatians, Christ changes one's family and future. This is a substantive and lasting transformation. And yet, for my purposes here, I am lifting up his phrase, you are clothed in Christ, to reflect on the gendered experiences of the world. Jesus experienced the world as male as a poor, itinerant male to be sure. But as a male, then, without question, this was an advantage in comparison with females. And he used that advantage, humbly, to serve others. And he also used that advantage to speak truth with power, to take the honor that he received and then glorify God. In some previous writing, I've argued that to address mixed gender groups of Christians as sons neither ignores women nor asks, like the conclusion to the Gospel of Thomas, that we become male so that we can participate in the life of God. No, instead to be addressed as sons is to be caught up into the honors and responsibilities afforded to sons at that time, and even more to be caught up into the honors and responsibilities afforded to the very Son of God, our brother. What an elevation this is for first century men, and even more for first century women, who, who, if they fit the norm, did not even have access to the earthly gains of sonship. So too in this instance, to be clothed with Christ is to be caught up into his experience of the world, his male experience of the world, and all the costs and benefits therein. Gentlemen, by virtue of your embodiment, you share what was true of Christ as a male navigating the world. It is a blessed elevation for you to be clothed in Christ, but it is not a category change. Conversely, because through baptism, I am clothed in him as well. It's something not mine by birth. Appeal to the slave-free dynamic serves as an illuminating parallel of this concept. In Philemon, Paul says to the slave owner, receive Onesimus not as a slave, but as more than a slave, as a brother. Welcome him as you would welcome me. We might say that Paul clothes Onesimus the slave with his own apostolic honor. Philemon has blessed freedom in Christ, which is a corollary of his given status. 
Onesimus has blessed freedom in Christ, but in so doing, his lived status is changed. In the house church, he is no longer to be treated as a slave, but as a brother. To return then to the embodied sex and its expression in society, which no one can deny are weighty categories of our being. By clothing ourselves with Christ in baptism unto discipleship, we are called to interact with one another as we would meet Christ. It's a teaching of Paul's that's very much in alignment with Jesus' own. To see in one another the weight of glory as those enveloped by Christ in baptism. And we are all called to live in his pattern of humility. And we may all walk in the freedom of his honor. Everyone's discipleship in Christ follows the same pattern. But the path to inhabit that discipleship is a different one, given one's particularities. Women who are clothed in Christ are invited into responsibilities and honor typically culturally afforded to men. And we should not use any of our advantages except with humility. And yet it also means that women, like Christ, may speak truth powerfully with spirit-filled wisdom. And women may and even must receive the honor they give and then give glory to God. I have not left myself the time to present the exegetical receipts. That project is in the works. But I am coming even more firmly to believe that in Paul's communities, he often elevates the honor of women, that they should, as their brothers, be received as Christ. This is not to say that Paul argues for a loss of embodied identity in Christian baptism any more than the Jews and Gentiles lose their ethnic heritage. Case in point, Paul maintains embodied difference in how women and men dress in worship, 1 Corinthians 11. Nevertheless, those baptized bodies are buffered by the embodied Savior. We receive one another as we would receive him. And in this modality of Christic discipleship, nothing is taken from men but resonant with a God who makes a place with the lowly, an added grace is given to women. Does Jesus get me since he did not navigate the world as a female? To be honest, even in preparing for today, that question seemed to matter less and less to me. Because hopefully as I grow in sanctification, and I more faithfully recognize and live into the clothing put upon me in baptism, the more and more I will get him. To know what it is to walk in humility, freedom, confidence, and God-glorifying honor. Our sister Mary teaches us beautiful things about discipleship, gives us insights into the character of our God, by paying more attention to her, I have learned even more fully that it is Jesus, her son, we follow. It is Christ we imitate in our embodied, and praise be to God, our fully clothed discipleship. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Peeler, for a stimulating and encouraging um, lecture. That was really wonderful. Uh, in a minute, we're going to have some time for questions, so feel free uh, if any of you uh, would like to make your way to one of the microphones. Uh, we have about 20, 25 minutes or so for questions, and then we'll have a couple of announcements. 
I have a lot of questions, I, but I'm just going to pick one for sure. now. Sure. All right. So um, uh, the first half of your lecture, um, a beautiful portrait of Mary as an exemplar in the Gospel of Luke. Love the connections you made with Matthew, even John and Acts um, as well. I'm wondering what you think about Mark. Yes. Mark has this um, uh, you know, episode, as you, as, you, as you know, where basically there's sort of that Mark and Sandwich where his mom, Mary, and the brothers come and say, yeah, go ahead, and say uh, he's out of his mind and they're going to take him back home. There's the little inclusio then where uh, in the middle you have the accusations uh, of Jesus being demon-possessed, and then Mary and the siblings show up again, and he ignores them and basically says, these are my mother and my brothers and sisters, those who do the will of God. So it's a pretty negative depiction, and I'm just curious how you make Absolutely. sense of Mark. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, so I think I would land on the second part of the sandwich where... Um, I, again, this is a bit of a canonical reading, but I do think there's space there that she has followed that order, right? She's done the will of God. The real question comes with how do we interpret the first part? And as, as you know, Josh, there are a lot of questions in verses 20 to 21 of Mark, uh, even uh, and hearing those from him, often translated as family, but the phrase is hoi par artu, doesn't have to be his family. It could be a wider associates, or maybe it's the brothers and not his mother. I don't think we're demanded by the Mark and Sandwich to equate those. It totally makes sense that it happens, but there's a little bit of a question how to interpret that. And then they came to Kratese to grasp him uh, because they were saying he is out of his mind. Well, is it the, the Hoi Para too who have come to grab him? And if they think he's out of his mind, Mark has just mentioned that he's doing so much ministry, he doesn't even have time to eat. So maybe they're like, oh, he's not taking care of himself. Uh, it, basically, the point is that pretty much at every word in Mark 20 to 21, you have interpretive decisions. And because I seek to read canonically, I think I'm going to choose to take the plausible and defensible exegetical decisions that would lead to a coherent reading of Mary's interaction. So I don't know that one could take her response in the Annunciation scene and then say all of a sudden she's forgotten who Jesus is. And even Luke's inclusion in the temple event in Luke 2, she seems a little confused, but I don't think she's confused about who Jesus is. She's confused about his actions. Uh, so I, I understand this is a hard text, but I, I think the exegetical puzzles of the first part of the sandwich open up the possibility of reading it in a more favorable way to her faith. We aren't demanded to see Mark as an outlier. Uh, if you'd like to see a bit of a reflection on that, I have a little chapter in a volume by Mike Ray and Michelle Panchuk in which I give a little bit more of the detail for that reading. Great, thanks so much. Um, questions? Please make your way or I will start calling on people. <laughs> Do you want to, can you um, go to the, the microphone? There's a microphone here and a microphone here as well. Uh, hello. Uh, um, one of the more controversial things about Mary is uh, Marian uh, dogmas, especially right. uh, in the, the Catholic Church mm -hmm. or the um, Eastern Orthodox churches. I was wondering, um, as Protestants, as, as you as an Anglican minister, would uh, like to maybe comment or share your thoughts on sort of uh, how to approach Mary in the context of as an evangelicals? Absolutely. What a wonderful question. Thank you so much. And it's interesting to study the history of those dogmas uh, proclaimed in about the 1850s and the 1950s, Immaculate Conception and Assumption. There's a lot of history of why those come to be proclaimed at that time. There's even tension between our Orthodox and Catholic brothers and sisters, if I understand correctly, that the Orthodox are more open to mystery, unsurprisingly, uh, and kind of say, we don't, we don't have, and then the Catholic dogmas uh, by Pope Pius IX, et cetera, were kind of more set. Um, I respect that the texts that we have in Matthew and Luke give us, there's almost like a deference in the New Testament that to not name too many details of this mystery. I stated earlier, there's enough to keep my class busy for 15 weeks and we still never finish. But there's not, we don't get every detail. 
And so I have come to the place of saying these doctrines of immaculate conception, that Mary was sinless even before her own conception, and then assumption that her body itself was taken into heaven. Because there are gaps in the text, I think um, I can see our Catholic uh, brothers and sisters, uh, they, this is allowed by the text. I don't think it's demanded by the text. And moreover, and I hope I display here a posture of continued teachability, but I think both doctrines have some pretty negative consequences about sexuality writ large, and especially female sexuality. It's not a necessity, but that path has been trod because of these doctrines. Then I have even more uh, disagreement with the doctrine of the assumption, because in some literature, what ends up happening is Jesus is assumed to the right hand of the Father, and Mary is assumed, and she becomes the example for women. Look, you too can be resurrected, and then what happens? Jesus becomes the example for men. But as I stated in my paper, Jesus is my savior, not Mary. And so any kind of male-female dichotomy, separate paths, I would firmly reject. Uh, but uh, these things are, are a heartbreak to all Christians who wish we had fellowship. And the, the stringency which with, with which the doctrines were proclaimed makes that bit challenging. But you'll find many Catholic authors as well who want to remain in conversation about this. And I've benefited from many of them. I hope that's helpful. Bridget. Hey, good to see you. Oh, there we go. Okay, so good to see you again, Dr. Peeler. Um, so I have your book pre-ordered, so I'm, I'm hoping to read it soon. I hope this isn't a spoiler, but um, I've, this is really interesting. I haven't heard this aspect of kind of trying to bring in a more feminine aspect of Jesus' identity and his, uh, his ministry. But um, I'm sure you're aware in church history, uh, Jesus was often associated with the female person of wisdom in Proverbs 8, repeatedly in the early Christian debates about the Trinity. I'd argue that it's in the Bible, but it's debatable. Um, also, there's text, for example, in Acts 2, it says that Jesus Christ underwent the birth pains of death. There are these uh, other kind of feminine aspects of Jesus that have been discussed in church history and in the Bible. Do these figure into your research in your upcoming book at all? What a wonderful question. Uh, not as much as maybe some readers would like, but the simple choice there was I think that literature has already been well developed and want to build upon it. Um, so I think you're absolutely right, Christ's association with wisdom. I do think Proverbs 8 is a solid place. I mean, you have the echoes of wisdom in 1 Corinthians, and this is much the field of, from which the author of Hebrews is drawing in, in uh, chapter 1. Um, and your question opens up an opportunity for me to say, I don't think this is what you were saying, but I get a little bit nervous about, right, gender is such a complicated thing, right? And I'm not a gender theorist. I've tried to read, but I'm certainly not an expert. Um, these kind of like, what is a display of masculinity and femininity that is so slippery. Uh, I'm fairly strongly resistant to putting people into boxes. I think people are a little bit more interested, interesting than just one category or another. So, um, I, I would get nervous in some literature that's like, oh, Jesus had these kind of different personality types because that seems to assume there's a certain category of things that are masculine and a certain category of things that are feminine. And since I'm seeking to resist that stringency, I, maybe that was another reason why I didn't press into that. There's a whole field of literature that investigates the question of, uh, you know, how does this DNA of Jesus work? That's a wonderful question. I love the work of Oliver Crisp, who takes up these questions. At the end of the day, we don't know, right? And we have to affirm that God is doing something mysterious. But what we get in the text is that Jesus both had a male body. At the earlier part of Luke 1, he was circumcised, so nobody asked any questions. Uh, and that, that he kind of existed in the world in this category. So I take that as my base and then seek to reflect maybe on a path that isn't as well trod. Uh, what might that mean for female inclusion and in someone who existed in the world in this way? So, but thank you. That literature can be very helpful aspects of it. Yeah. Kevin. Uh, thank you for your talk, uh, Dr. Peeler. Um, I just have a question, maybe trying to make some connections here with Hebrews. Um, ah, I, I've read that book before. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you made a comment about Jesus's particularity guarantees his ability to save rather than inhibiting it. And I'm wondering, how does that connect with your understanding of Jesus's high priestly intercession in Hebrews, and especially uh, Hebrews 4.15? 
where it talks about how he can sympathize with us in our weaknesses because he's been tested. Um, kind of the more you press particularity, it seems like the more challenging it gets. That's true. Is it like in his particularity, he kind of has an experience of something more kind of like uni universal to human suffering? Or what is it about the particularity that maybe can actually help us understand how he can help people in other circumstances? Yes, thank you for that question. And here I would definitely direct you to the work of my colleague Mark Cortez and his wonderful treatments of theological anthropology, especially Christological anthropology, where really I'm drawing that line from him, uh, that uh, Jesus is an individual. And so even in his temptation, I think this is such a fascinating part of Christology, the, the, the sense in which Hebrews 4.15, how do we play that out? Uh, it may not map onto, uh, kind of like what I was saying, like we're all tempted in different ways and that kind of spectrum, Jesus isn't going to match up exactly. I think for Hebrews, uh, the important things are that primarily the, the temptation that he faces, and I'm gonna go back here to chapter two, is that he has experienced that fear of death by which all humans are kept enslaved. And so that fear of death is very basic. Uh, my friend and colleague Patrick Gray, his work on fear uh, in Hebrews is superb, but that then can radiate in many different forms. But I would say for Hebrews, that's a, a key beginning point for how he shares our experience. I mean, to be honest, too, well, it's been fun for me to think about the two parts of my scholarly work, uh, Incarnation, Mary, and Hebrews, and I think are places that there's kind of some fun stuff possibly going on, but I have to recognize that the author of Hebrews is not asking the same questions I'm asking when I go to the Gospels. I think he's like, hey, y'all are suffering. Jesus was human. He's now seated. Okay, keep going. Like, it's more of a crisis situation in some sense for the weariness of their faith. Yes, hi. Um, Dr. Peeler, thank you for your time with us this morning and afternoon. <clears throat> the, uh, the virgin birth is such an incredible and supernatural event. Um, I'm curious, in your opinion, outside of Matthew and Luke, why do you think the other New Testament writers choose not to mention this? Yeah, no, that is a fantastic question with which I've sat for a long time and res wrestled with. Um, the story of how the Gospels are written, and I'm also not a Gospel scholar, uh, so others in the room might be able to say this better, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but if it is the case that Mark is writing first, and that seems plausible to me, it's like the adult life of Jesus, the ministry, I'm going to hurry up and get you to the cross. <laughs> right? And then I do think it makes sense that Matthew says, and we need to tell more, and Luke, we need to tell more, uh, and then John takes us all the way back to creation. Um, I... I don't know, I think for Mark it's just get it out there. I take the view that John is supplemental. Uh, I think there is evidence that he has knowledge of, this, of the synoptics and builds upon them. So maybe, I really appreciate Richard Bauckham's work. Like if we think about the gospel communities as these little silos, we're not understanding the interpenetration of Christian communities. So there would be knowledge, that seems convincing to me. Moreover, and I reflect on this um, in the book, um, it's a risk to tell the birth narrative story. That to me was quite eye-opening and helpful. If you think about the Greco-Roman context, there are a whole lot of stories of gods raping women and you have these like demigod things. Uh, it, th this, is, this is risky for them to tell it. I mean, early on, Celsus says, oh yeah, she was raped by a Roman soldier and you made up this story. And this remains among many parts of Christian scholarship <laughs> virginal conception, what a myth, right? And, and so I think it was Matthew and Luke who made the decision that this was a risk worth taking, not only because I think they are adhering to the eyewitness account that they've received, but, which I seek to dial out here, this says something maybe they didn't even realize, but by the power of the inspiration of the Spirit, it makes profound interpretive difference for how we think about gender of God and ourselves. So I think that's some of it. Uh, I mentioned a bit that um, I think there's more work to be done in Paul. Uh, I, uh, when I first presented the manuscript of this book, I ended up pulling quite a bit of material on Paul. It was underdeveloped. It needed more work. I'm grateful for that recommendation. But I will plan to make the argument in the follow-up volume to this that I think Paul shows an awareness of the mode of the incarnation, and it actually appears in those passages that have proven, at least for us Protestants, most challenging. 
I think he's drawing from it in both 1 Corinthians 11 and 1 Timothy 2. Uh, and we know that he knows it because he says it in Galatians 4, and yet I think there is radiation of that. So I think Paul may be more of a witness than he has been recognized. Uh, but the others, uh, Mark, just get me a story, John, he builds upon. And Acts, uh, Luke, I mean, he, he, he draws from there. And Revelation, Revelation 12, right? Go to Christian art. Like, there's a lot of Marian work going on there. Thank you so much, Dr. Peeler, for your wonderful talk. My question might not be directly related to your sure. topic, but um, it's on doctrine of sin and Christology. Sure. sure. And I was wondering, so if Christ embodiment comes from the Theotokos, but if you also deny the sinlessness of Mary, ah. what kind of implications would that have for Christ's nature? You mentioned T.F. Torrance, and I think T.F. Torrance takes the view that Christ had a sinful nature. Mm -hmm. And uh, how would, what kind of implications would that have mm -hmm. for his nature? Yeah, thank you so much. And here I will disclose my naivete as a biblical scholar and not a real theologian, even though I like to pretend to be one. Um, I find Torrance's argument convincing, so I, maybe I should name that. Uh, and I am influenced by, I recognize this could be controversial in some places, but I'm influenced by, maybe not totally beholden to, an apocalyptic view of Paul. At least I was taught by some very good teachers like Beverly Gaventa to think of sin as this power, not just individual sins. So to, to the degree that Christ's flesh is open to real temptation, that te seems to me to be the necessary reading of Hebrews 4. A temptation can't be a play. Like it has to be real, and yet he resisted it, and he lived in the world, and our world is infected by the results of sin. That may be, I recognize there are much more complex answers that I really enjoy reading about in theology, but that's a few places in the text that have made sense to me. Seeing no one, I'll, I'll get in a question here. Um, <laughs> One of, one of the things I'm still thinking about with your paper was your argument with Galatians 3, 26, 27. Mm -hmm. I don't have it exactly memorized, but you said something like, based on Paul saying we've been clothed mm -hmm. with Christ, we males are caught up into his own male experience of the world. Am I getting you to some extent mm -hmm. right there? So. so I guess my question is, can we, what does that mean? Like, what, can we look at, our, our, would, would that presume we look at Jesus to understand sort of what masculinity is, oh, a male oh. experience, or do you more just want to say there are certain uh, privileges mm. that come and we are, you know, you know, follow a life of service and sacrifice and renunciation, right. even if some of those. Yeah. Does that make sense? I, I think yeah. so. And this is so helpful. And this is all new material. And so I'm so grateful for the chance to try some ideas out and get feedback. Here's what I meant. And I think I hopefully we'll find a way to say this with more clarity. Uh, a male disciple is caught up into the honor of being a follower of the Son of God. So I'm thinking here maybe of categories of inheritance and stewardship. I happen to be writing right now in Hebrews 2, so there's a lot of stuff going on right there. That is an elevation for men. I didn't quite mean kind of going into Jesus teaches us how to be a real man. Um, I, I, I'm so influenced by kind of masculinity studies, especially by my dear friend Brittany Wilson, that I'm like, eh, no, I don't, I don't mean that. Um, but there is an elevation. So let's, let's say, here's the male disciple, oh, caught up into the honor of Christ. Okay, here's a female disciple who doesn't even share kind of the earthly privileges and costs, right? I, please hear me. This is vitally important. I am not the kind of feminist that's like, I want women on top. Like, we, you know, we haven't had a good, and now we're, no, 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 in the church we are called together, right? So that's really important to me. So, but the female disciple doesn't even have the honor of existing as a male, clearly in the first century world, I think we could safely argue that that remains true in a lot of spaces on our world. And so look, it's almost like a, sorry, <laughs> I don't mean like look, but like uh, she's caught up into kind of on this double. Like she gets up to this level, clothing with Christ, with his honor, freedom, speaking in truth, and, and then caught up to, to the same place as the male disciple, but she started in a different place. That's kind of the visual yeah. that I'm thinking about. Yeah. But, but I need some time then to process to maybe work that out 
better. It, it reminds me a little bit of Paul's argument. You, you did with Onesimus a little bit, but, and Philemon, but in 1 Corinthians 7 about the one who's, I, I'll get it mixed up, mm. but the one who's uh, the, the slave master who's called and the Lord becomes, yes. you know, uh, the, you know, there's the status reversal between the, the, the slave and the oh, master. That's good. And that's another yeah. good text. Yeah. That's helpful. Yeah. Because I really, and, and honestly, this came from the conversation that I had on the Two Cities podcast a few weeks ago when John Dunn said, well, yeah, what does this mean for discipleship? And I hadn't really thought about the question in this way, kind of like embodied existence in the world, then kind of set me down this path of exploring this possibility. Great, thanks. Other questions? We have time for maybe two, two more or so. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Peeler. Um, I think uh, as you were answering that last question, the question came to my mind, this isn't Marian necessarily, but when we have the present reality in Ephesians 5, Paul's looking at marriage and saying yes, um, yes. Christ in the church, there is a kind of differentiation there. Right. I was curious just to hear your reflection on what kind of that might look like for discipleship in the present age, even though marriage isn't an eschatological reality. Absolutely. So, yeah. Oh, thank you for naming that. Um, I do a little bit of reflections on Ephesians 5, but I think there's more that I should do. My short answer is this. In that beautiful picture, which of course is, is a, appears in the Old Testament as well, right? It's um, not the most frequent image, but it is present. Uh, I think that we view the marriage metaphor, we're asked to view the marriage metaphor in Scripture through, again, the lens of the Incarnation. Um, and so if in that relationship, Christ and the church, husband and bride, we know that on the bride side, things are complicated because we're made up of men and women. And what I'm making the argument is that Christ too is complicated. <laughs> I, I say uh, he's male, but male like no other. And so if uh, that invites at least a conversation about when we then map these on to human relationships, can we honor that complexity? I'm completely ambiguous about how people describe their marriages uh, because they can be healthy and fruitful as they seek to glorify God and serve one another no matter what terminology they use. And I think that different kinds of systems of way of living out one's marriage are both rooted in Ephesians 5. Huh. So it's about something we should all just get along. Uh, uh, but I, I do think like attention to Jesus's identity add some complexity to that picture. I, I make the argument in the book that any time we think about God and humanity, it is creator creation, and we should be re we should absolutely not, sorry, I'm going to state this firmly, absolutely not make that a dichotomy with some form of masculinity and femininity. I absolutely reject that. I think that's disrespectful to God, not because masculine is bad, but because God is not human. God is creator. No, recognize that Jesus became male, everything I just said about his complexity. Uh, thank you, Dr. Peeler. Um, I had a question regarding, and this was an incredible, it was just kind of caught me really by surprise, but it shouldn't, because uh, I've read the text so many times, uh, how much Mary took on the shame mm. um, of accepting the call that the angel gave to mm. her. And that brought a question to mind, the difference between how male and female interact with honor and shame. Oh, that's um, a fascinating question. And I just was just wondering, especially within the context of, you know, as, as followers and disciples of Christ, mm. then how do we, mm. as men and women, kind of interact with shame and, what, and, 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 uh, and honor? Mm. And how do those dynamics play as we seek to follow after Christ in the way that he gave honor to God and, uh, and honor to the lowly and wow. also bore shame himself. Yes. Oh, thank you for that question. Wow. I think our, our call that we see in Scripture is always twofold, that we step into whatever God has called us, but we aren't asked to deny the realities of our existence, right? Hence my kind of jab about Gnosticism. No, we really get to honor who we are. And so I think this could apply to honor and shame. 
if I were, if I had had time to say more, if I had made time to say more about Joseph, I actually think that could be a place to press into those dynamics. And there's really a lot of excellent literature on his wonderful character. But I have wondered if Matthew is playing upon the word for righteous there, right? His first idea is, I'm going to be righteous. I'm going to follow the law. I'm going to cut off. You know, she's been unfaithful, so I'm not going to be with that messiness. But I'm going to do it in a nice way. That's righteous. But then what the angel asks him to do is a different kind of righteousness. And it actually, I think, might connect with Jesus' statement later in the Sermon on the Mount, your righteousness should exceed that of those who are really careful about keeping the law. Joseph's righteousness then becomes the righteousness, yea, even of Christ, who displays his righteousness in taking on our shame. So Joseph's, Joseph's decision then to take Mary into his home, whatever that risk might be, is a picture of the dynamic of someone in maybe a privileged pri position taking on the shame, and Mary in a less pri privileged position owning that. And my colleague Esau McCulley, to return to the previous question, if I may, has a really fantastic reading of Ephesians 5 that works on this same dynamic. Uh, he will state, you know, I don't think that our world is wildly different than the first century. And so men, if there are spaces in which you are privileged, you are called to the kind of Christic salvific uh, in your relationship with your spouses, just as the Ephesian men were called. So there might be another space to press into the differences in that same call. Thank you for that question. Final question. Have you received your own copy of yeah. your book yet? Yeah. Or you have. It's in my okay. backpack, yeah. So I was gonna yeah. see if you would pose for a picture while I hold my copy. No, <laughs> um, uh, couple of announcements, and then we'll give a round of applause for Dr. Peeler. Um, first of all, uh, you can all get a copy of this for 40% off. Uh, Matt's gonna get to the screen in a second. All right, so we'll just wait and watch him go. <laughs> 40% off, um, and uh, November 10th, I think, is our next Henry Center lecture. Kristen Johnson uh, is going to be here with us, so we'd love to have you all come back. Uh, as Matt continues to find that 40% code, and we encourage you to buy the book. There it is. There we go. Let's give a round of applause for Dr. Peter. Thank you so much. Thank you.